SpaceX has destroyed Massey's. We knew that from the start, but they don't want to slow down the launch cadence. It appears they're ready to implement the backup plan. A big step in this direction is the construction of an orbital launch mount ship adapter, which is proving to be a crucial component of their overall strategy. In addition, we have updates on the new Block 3 nose cones, significant progress occurring at Pad 2, and the installation of critical components on the new orbital launch mount. There's all of that and much more coming up in your Starbase update. One matter we must certainly discuss this week is the weather. If there has been one significant hindrance impeding SpaceX's progress, it is the incessant rain that has been relentlessly battering Boca Chica. We're speaking of heavy, persistent downpours that continue to return day after day. Puddles have been forming along the highway, with sections even flooding, and this sort of stormy, waterlogged weather truly hampers any outdoor work. But here's the thing, just because the weather's been a bit rough, that doesn't mean SpaceX had to halt all operations. Despite the rain, they still managed to push forward and get some things done. Later in the week, we actually got some surprisingly good news in regards to the Massey's test site, which was a welcome change. We spotted the nitrogen side of the tank farm starting to spool up again for the first time since Ship 36's mishap. Now, it might have only been a short eight minute test, but still, this was clearly a sign of controlled and intentional operations, and that's important. This specific area of the test site is the furthest from the location of the enormous fireball caused by Ship 36, so it is entirely logical that it would be the first section to resume operations. From what we can ascertain, the damage here was minimal, if there was any at all. This could indicate that SpaceX is potentially preparing to resume testing of booster 18.1, and may also be readying for Ship 38's cryogenic proof testing sooner than anticipated. This would be a significant achievement for their forthcoming plans. It should be noted that SpaceX relies extensively on data from these test tank trials to confirm that the updated designs of their vehicles will perform and operate precisely as intended. Also at Massey's this week, we observed that the cleanup effort is very much still ongoing. There is a considerable amount of debris scattered across the site, ranging from severely damaged pieces of metal and heavy ground support equipment to fragments of Ship 36 remains. It is an enormous task and we can see that SpaceX is addressing it incrementally, gradually clearing the area as they progress. Another observation this week is that work appears to have commenced on removing all the severely damaged components of the large crab stand used for ship static fire testing. It does appear that this stand might be salvageable after all, otherwise it's unlikely we would see this ongoing work if there was nothing to reuse. This repair work is something that we will continue to monitor over the coming weeks. Another significant uncertainty surrounding Massey's at present is the central section of the test site, the area situated between the static fire test stand and the test tank testing location, where boosters and ships typically undergo cryogenic proof testing. For booster testing, it is entirely plausible that SpaceX might temporarily relocate this to the Pad A orbital launch mount at the launch site. That would be a logical move. They've tested boosters there before more times than I can count on my fingers. However, when it comes to ship cryogenic proof testing, the situation is somewhat less certain. The critical question is whether SpaceX will attempt to commence cryogenic proof testing of ships on the Pad A orbital to launch mount using the adapter, or whether the massive ship cryogenic proof testing area remains sufficiently intact to be reused. From what we've seen, SpaceX crews have recently been closely examining that testing location at Massey's, likely seeking to determine the extent of the damage and whether it is even worth salvaging. The decision could hinge on whether they plan to conduct further Block 2 testing there or if they are already focusing on Block 3. Frankly, at this stage, it appears increasingly likely that they will concentrate directly on Block 3, bypassing any major reconstruction efforts solely for Block 2. SpaceX also began removing some of the severely damaged methane pumps from Massey's on Friday. These are typically used to pump methane into the ship, but given their proximity to the incident, the damage is likely so extensive that they require a complete replacement. Checking in with the Gigabay, the foundation preparation work is, well, still in progress. No great surprise there, it's a substantial task. We are still a while away from seeing any of the Gigabay framework begin to rise from the ground here. 
We anticipate that the construction of this bay will differ from that of the other bays. It is likely that this bay will be assembled piece by piece on site using multiple tower cranes if the construction of the Starbase Gigabay follows the approach of the Roberts Road Gigabay in Florida. For now, however, it's more foundation work. On a few occasions throughout the week, a self-propelled modular transporter, or SPMT, was roving across the Gigabay Foundation groundwork carrying what appeared to be stacks of counterweights. It is not entirely clear what the purpose of these movements was, but it is certainly plausible that this may have been load testing of the groundwork or just a quick and easy way to compact the soil beneath. Naturally, it would not be a typical week in Starbase without at least one enigmatic hot staging ring movement. This time, the ring was transported back into the Star Factory from Mega Bay 1, so no, it is not remaining on top of Booster 16 for the time being. As usual, this merely adds to the ongoing conundrum of determining where these rings are actually intended to end up. It has been a bit of a whirlwind trying to track them recently, and frankly, if you're closely following the movement of the hot staging rings, you're likely just as perplexed as we are. Still, it's part of the fun, right? It's that time again, time for our McGregor Minute. Between Monday and Thursday this past week, SpaceX conducted a total of 21 tests at their McGregor test facility in Texas. That is a substantial number of firings packed into just a few days. Of course, Friday was the 4th of July, so as anticipated, activities quietened down for the holiday to the degree that SpaceX only conducted one Falcon second stage firing. Out of those prior 21 tests, seven were Merlin engine firings, two were Falcon 9 second stage tests, and one was a Falcon 9 first stage test. On Wednesday, the Falcon 9 first stage currently sitting at McGregor fired up its nine million engines for a solid 77 second test burn, qualifying it for the next round of flights. There's actually another Falcon 9 booster at McGregor as well, so expect that first booster to come down soon and the other one to get installed pretty quickly after. Alongside all of that, there were several Raptor engine tests happening on both the Raptor South and Raptor vertical test stands. The highlight of the week definitely had to be the show on the Raptor South stand, where one Raptor Raptor engine went through three separate relights, adding up to four burns of about 20 seconds each, all within just a few minutes. It was quite the spectacle. From what we understand, a lot of these test stands, if not all of them, are now set up to run the new Raptor 3 engines. That means SpaceX is really pushing the Raptor 3 through its paces as it moves closer and closer to being ready for flight on their rockets. We didn't see any engine tests on Saturday, however, whatever testing was underway ended up in an overpressure. This pop ejected some sort of dark object into the sky at high speed where, following 20 seconds, it returned to the ground a fair distance away. Could this be some sort of COPV testing SpaceX is trying out to gather more data following Ship 36's COPV failure? Unfortunately, unless SpaceX says anything, that is pure speculation. If you want to catch all of this action live and keep up with what's happening at McGregor, be sure to check out McGregor Live 24-7. Moving to the launch site's Pad 2, all 20 hold down arms are now fitted to the orbital launch mount and teams will continue to work on adding any additional hardware to them and fully integrating them for operational status. If you recall, when the mount was initially rolled out, there were only four of these clamps in place, sufficient for SpaceX to lift and move the OLM as a whole in its current position. However, now that the pad is progressing, they clearly require many more of these clamps. These pieces of hardware are essential for ensuring that super heavy boosters are securely held to the launch mount. Meanwhile, welding work continues robustly on the tower at pad 2. The tower is coming together significantly now, including the installation of numerous cladding panels at the base of the tower on the sides facing the orbital launch mount. However, it still lacks some critical components such as the ship quick disconnect arm. Frankly, we are probably not too far away from seeing that final major piece installed. Once SpaceX mounts the arm to the tower, they'll still of course need to fully hook it up, but that should be one of the last major steps to fully prepare the tower for operation. On Tuesday, despite the rather heavy rain, we observed the delivery of items that appear to be potential quick disconnect hood parts for the Pad 2 booster quick disconnect system. These white components were visible on the back of a flatbed lorry, and frankly, their shape strongly suggests they are booster quick disconnect hoods. The parts were initially taken to the Sanchez storage lot, which is quite logical. Typically, such components are inspected and prepared there before being transported to the pad for final installation. Later in the day, we then saw the same part staged over at pad 2 for installation. And then on Wednesday, it happened, the installation of these key parts. This hood section was installed next to where the connections for the liquid oxygen BQD exit the service structure. With the upcoming Block 3 design, SpaceX is moving away from just having one single quick disconnect connection and switching to a multi-connection setup. 
This upgrade is aimed at allowing a much higher flow rate of propellants down the line. What's the easiest way to double capacity? Double the number of pipes. On Thursday, the second part of this LOX BQD hood lower section was installed to the side of the orbital launch mount as well. Now, the BQD hood itself won't, of course, directly fuel the super heavy booster, but it will protect the liquid oxygen GSE lines that connect to and fuel the booster. The hood acts as a protective cover, shielding those lines from damage so they don't have to be replaced or repaired after every single launch, making operations smoother and more efficient. At least that's probably what SpaceX hopes to achieve with the whole rapid reuse thing after all the issues they've faced over time with the booster quick disconnect on the pad A launch mount. You know, all the scaffolding around the pad does make it appear rather less complete than it truly is. In reality, much of the pipework in the service structure is already installed, and a significant portion of that pipework is now being connected to the orbital launch mount as well. Certainly, there is still some detailed work to be done, but SpaceX is undoubtedly getting closer to preparing the pad for testing. It is thrilling to see progress like this and if everything remains on schedule we could be looking at test activities commencing within the next few weeks or months. One aspect that is always challenging to gauge clearly is the progress on installing data lines, smaller electronics and all those minute components that form part of supporting infrastructure like this. We can readily observe the large pipes and substantial cover installations from a distance but the real question is how many of those small behind the scenes elements are still absent? Frankly, that's a SpaceX secret they are unlikely to disclose anytime soon. So for now, it remains part of the mystery behind the scenes. The tank farm is already preparing for commissioning, as we noted last week, and this week has been no exception. We have observed ongoing testing of several areas at the power to end of the tank farm in recent weeks. It is evident that they are making steady progress to ensure everything is ready and fully operational when the Block 3 vehicles are ready to fly. Speaking of Block 3 vehicles, peeking inside the nose cone hall in the Star Factory, we can still see that our Block 3 nose cones are very much in their hedgehog phase. Over on the left, there is the first Block 3 ship, Ship 39, which appears to have all the pins for the heat shield tiles installed at this point and is simply awaiting the next steps in the construction process. On the right you can see Ship 40, also a Block 3 ship, currently getting its tile pins installed. The big question we're still wondering about from last week is when will SpaceX actually start putting the tiles and thermal blankets onto Ship 39? From what we can tell, it's still completely naked in terms of tile coverage. Looking further along the production line, we can observe Ships 41 and 42 at the subsequent workstations. Naturally, neither of these have reached the pin installation stage yet. However, differences between them are already apparent. Ship 41 on the left is beginning to show weld lines for the header tank, whereas Ship 42 on the right does not have these yet. Thus, even between workstations, progress is clearly visible as the ships advance through the construction process. Taking a closer look inside the Star Factory, we can observe what appears to be the dome of a future starship visible through one of the windows. It is always thrilling to catch these small glimpses of what is to come. Why is this stacking timeline so significant? Let's take a look at some dates. Ship 36 began stacking on the 30th of January 2025, and Ship 35 started on the 10th of December 2024. From the commencement of the stacking, to the first single engine static fire test, Ship 36 took 136 days and Ship 35 took 141 days. That is fairly consistent timing thus far. Even if we assume SpaceX can accelerate the process slightly, perhaps reducing it to 120 days between starting to stack Ship 39 and conducting its first static fire, that would place Ship 39's first static fire at the beginning of November, with a potential launch closer to mid-November. However, as this is the first Block 3 vehicle, there is a strong likelihood of of some delays. That is likely a best case scenario. If SpaceX aims to meet Elon Musk's target of launching Block 3 this year, they will probably need to begin stacking Ship 39 by early August at the latest. That is certainly achievable, but it is crucial to keep this timeline in mind and monitor developments. Applying the same logic to Super Heavy Boosters, it took 234 days from the start of stacking Booster 16 to its static fire, and 251 days for Booster 15. Booster 18 stacking commenced in mid-May, which suggests that, if everything remains on schedule, it could be ready around mid to late December. Thus, whether considering the booster or the ship, the end of the year is shaping up to be a very tight race, particularly if construction times for Block 3 do not improve significantly 
over Block 2. And of course, Friday was the 4th of July. For the curious amongst you, that's why Jack is unavailable for this episode. To mark the occasion, the county and city of Starbase hosted a fireworks celebration at the launch pad, visible from the beach, open to all. The event included a live band, some welcoming remarks from local politicians, and of course, a fireworks display. If you want to go and watch the entire display, make sure to go and check out our Flame Trench 4th of July special, where not only did we watch the SpaceX fireworks show, but we also launched a few of our own. Yeah! And to all of our American viewers, we hope you had a wonderful 4th of July weekend. As we mentioned last week, SpaceX appears to be attempting one of the wackiest bodge jobs Starbase has ever seen, and over the week we've been keeping an eye on the adapter they have begun constructing. This adapter will be a significant development, enabling them to conduct static fire tests of Starships directly on the Pad A orbital launch mount, which was designed to only accommodate current gen super heavy boosters. The stand they are working on, a repurposed ship transport stand, is positioned right beside the orbital launch mount, and thanks to the work over the week, we are now gaining a clear understanding of SpaceX's plans. The top section is already functioning as intended, equipped with six clamps designed to secure to a Starship, as it was originally built for transporting Starship upper stages. The particularly intriguing aspect is what is happening at the base. This stand serves two primary purposes. Firstly, it provides some clearance from the orbital launch mount, ensuring the aft flaps on the Starship do not come into contact with any part of the launch mount. Secondly, it acts as an adapter to connect to the robust orbital launch mount itself. It is highly likely that SpaceX will modify this transport stand to securely attach to the exceptionally strong OLM, which will then safely hold the ship during static fire testing. The remainder of the pad infrastructure probably requires minimal modification. After all, it is designed to handle the immensely powerful 33 engine super heavy booster, so firing six engines on a Starship is relatively straightforward. And then, just a day later, it was cutting time. Sparks were seen flying as SpaceX cut off some parts of the former ship transport stand labelled SQR3 to make way for new hardware to be welded to those locations. The cutting on the stand went on almost all night. Following on Thursday night, we caught even more welding ongoing near the OLM. It's a bit tough to tell exactly what they're working on, but this could very well be preparation work for the adapter stand. It definitely looks like SpaceX has transformed this area right next to the OLM into what you might call the adapter construction zone. It makes a lot of sense that what we're seeing could be some prefabrication for additional parts needed to finish the adapter. Not long after, the classic SpaceX and Tesla emergency construction tent popped up next to the adapter, where they've been doing additional grinding and preparation work. Meanwhile, the main stand itself is subject to constant welding and grinding. As the week went on, you could really see how much focus SpaceX is putting on the adapter build. It's clear this is a top priority. On Friday, we observed several components near the adapter, which appear to be the hooks that will be welded to the stand to connect it to the launch mount, enabling proper installation of the ship without damaging either the ship or the OLM. As it stands, it appears that SpaceX has begun moving some more components towards the vicinity of the stand, so by this time next week, the picture could be even clearer. SpaceX is under pressure to get this done quickly, but of course, they also need to do it carefully. They can't risk damaging Pad A's OLM, which is currently their only hope for all of their testing and launching activities. All of their eggs are literally in one basket. Do you think it'll work? I certainly hope so. Regarding the protection of the orbital launch mount, SpaceX is also actively engaged in repairing and preparing the mount at Pad A for the upcoming test campaign. Upon inspection, one can truly appreciate the extent of the wear and tear this launch mount has endured over time. After all, this launch mount has been in use since before Starship Flight 1. It experienced that intense, destructive launch, along with eight subsequent launches, numerous static fire tests, and much more. It boasts a significant launch history, and the signs of set of events are clearly evident. That said, its operational life will soon draw to a close. We will be observing closely to see how the new orbital launch mount design performs after nine launches. SpaceX also appears to be conducting tests related to Pad A and its tank farm. On Tuesday, we observed the tank farm beginning to vent, followed by the launch mount also venting. These vents typically come into play when preparing for propellant loading. Of course, there was no vehicle at the pad at the time, but it is quite intriguing to see these tests occurring, particularly with the significant modifications SpaceX has planned for that area. Perhaps they are testing the specifications and procedures required to load a ship using the booster side of the tank farm? Who can say? And with that, another week at Starbase comes to a close. I've been Ryan Cater for NSF, thanks for watching and goodbye.